everyone gets a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Nancy Orlin Weber has a highly developed sense of intuition. She's a nurse and a medical intuitive, but she's best known for being a psychic detective. What is that? It's someone who uses her psychic powers to help solve crimes. Nancy is the author of The Life of a Psychic Detective. In her book, she shares amazing stories about how her intuitive powers have brought justice and closure to many families. Please welcome Nancy Orland Weber to Bump in the Road. Welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Hi. Hi, Pat. It's so nice to be with you. I'm Nancy Orland Weber, and most people have heard that I am a psychic detective. They've either read the book, The Life of a Psychic Detective, or my animal communication one. However, I started life as adult nurse, my career life. And the reason I went into it is I found the great strength in relieving suffering physically for people and sometimes emotionally. I had been molested by a teacher, molested by an uncle. Um, And then right after I graduated nursing school, I was injured by a patient, spent almost two years in and out of hospital beds. So I knew what it was like to be both incapacitated and helpless and needing uh, totally dependent at times. And I also knew what it was like to make a difference in somebody's life. I think that's part of why I got to do what I got to do. I had been born psychic, as we say, but psychic means soul. That's the origin of the word in Greek. And so I believe everyone has a soul. And I was certainly, if you want to call it gifted, with a sharp focus and seeing things like death before it occurred visited by my grandmother the moment she died, I woke up, things of that sort. I didn't question what it was. I was curious, but I didn't really question. I just thought, well, it's the way that we're born. And I didn't know people didn't do it. Fast forward, I was married. My first husband attempted to murder me while I was pregnant. And at that moment, that was a pivotal moment in my turning point. Uh, I faked death. I slumped down because he was strangling me. I knew any second we'd be gone, my daughter and I to be. And I just slumped down, let go. And he let go and went and had a drink in the kitchen. And I waited. I kept looking out of a slit in my eye. And then I stood up, walked in to kitchen and told him because I was no longer the yes girl. Victims get to be very yes. Right. They get scared of saying no. And I certainly was scared of saying no to a lot of people. But when anybody needed help, that was a different world. I would fight for them. But they never fought for me until that moment. And I walked in and he looked shocked. And I said, I suggest you never sleep at night. There might be a knife in your heart. You either touch me again, you're dead. And that was it. But we were stranded in a place where I had no phone, no car, no anything, no family. And so I had to wait till I gave birth, almost died as a consequence. Then we moved a year later, and finally I could divorce him, throw him out, gain full custody of my daughter. That was something that I know a lot of people go through, domestic violence. A lot of people go through just being abused, not just, but being abused as a child, being abused throughout life. It's that moment in time where you don't care how dare you do this to me, is more important than being frightened of the bully. And so I became fearless, not only for others, but for me. 
And that kept happening in my life. I left nursing because of the injuries. I had a second operation. Turns out I had congenital deformities that exaggerated it. And so I decided, although I love psychiatry and I was great at breaking through schizophrenics and psychotics in days, sometimes in minutes, I loved it. But it taught me that the gifts are really a gift, that you have to blend practical, physical, emotional, and the metaphysical. And so I opened up a career as a psychic, although I didn't call it that. I was very uncomfortable calling it anything. Took me a couple of years before I'd let people think that that's what I was doing. They knew it, so they sent me people, and I was busy. And in 1980, uh, detectives came into my life asking for help. And so that became a sidebar that when Court TV became uh, interested in doing a series on psychic detectives, I was the first or second one to be hired. And then from there, others spun it. But what people don't know about this is that's a sidebar. That's not my work. My work is spiritual counseling. I'm a minister. I've authored two books. It's helping and supporting other people so that maybe we make it easier for them not to go through as much as they go through. Your story just amazes me because you, you have really profound gifts. Does everybody have these talents within them? Mm, probably to some degree in different ways. So I think that some people who are phenomenally talented in writing songs and writing books that make a difference in the world in doing any kind of art that makes a difference in the world. Wouldn't you say they have incredible gifts? <clears throat> to me, it's the same gift pointed in a different direction. You know, you, you mentioned making a difference in the world. And that is sometimes at odds, I think, with the society we live in, where we're very externally oriented, materially oriented, and it doesn't have the same energy that making a difference has. How do you reconcile that? Or and an odd way for me, I think everybody has to find their own, I call it the back door. How do I get people to understand what clarity is for them if they don't feel clear? You know, it, it isn't techniques as much as what I think of as a consistency of commitment to not only take care of others, take care of themselves, and take care of the earth. Because we are biologically needing the planet. So when we use things that are not supportive of the planet's health, I think unconsciously we store that inside. But I also know that physically we store that you know, with the insecticides, pesticides, petrochemical industry, personal care products, and all kinds of things. We know where it goes, and it interrupts the nervous system. That's part of it. So I've seen that when I worked in psychiatry. I refused to give sugar to the patients. I refused to give them junk food. I had control over it, and I insisted. I decided the rooms all had to be painted blue, soft blues, not bright, happy colors. They needed calming. They needed less fear. So I think it's everything. It's not only uh, coming into the deeper internal event it is, I think, contingent on being in consistency with life itself. The reason I say that is there are psychics who, if you talk with them in mediums and all kinds of people who are dedicated to taking care of themselves and the food they eat and the personal care products they use, and they support environmental issues, et cetera. That's consistency. And you can see it in the result of what they say. Whereas others may still be gifted in lots of ways, but you can see the um, inconsistency with, so, so what if you're psychic and you know something? Good. Now what? 
does it benefit the other person or not? And if you get something, what are you going to do about it for them? Are you going to help them learn what to do for themselves? Or do you just like the power of knowing stuff? You talk about clarity. Um, obviously, clarity is part of this consistency that you talk about. Mm -hmm. um, what else goes into clarity? Uh, well, it, I think it all works together. It's like a beautiful orchestra. So if you can take slow, deep breaths, whether you meditate or whether you pray or whether you simply quiet down and sit at the base of a tree and love the woods, whatever it is that satisfies your hunger for being connected to life. Because as you so aptly said, it's not the stuff that you have. You know that bumper sticker years ago, uh, the person who dies with the most toys win. Oh, yeah. I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, you can't take it with you. Is that, how silly is that? But how silly it is in today's world and any time on this planet to think that the more stuff you have, the happier you are. It's a lie. We know that. Oh, it's an absolute lie. I mean, uh, I would say that actually – if you seek some sort of satisfaction from something external, particularly something material, um, it is a, a, a vapid enterprise and it's not going to get you anywhere. No. I remember somebody who came early on, somewhere in the mid 70s, and he sat down and I noticed he was jingling his change in his pocket. And I looked at him and I had some some tuning in and I said, uh, you're a landlord of an apartment building? He said, yes. I said, really? So you collect all that money and you own the building, correct? He said, yes. I said, but why do I see you in black robes and not only sitting on a bench in court, but also going to court for something? He said, well, I am a judge. <laughs> I don't think they go hand in hand. <laughs> And uh, I am being indicted for uh, uh, an attempt to do something with one of the clients. Kind of, right, make, whatever. And I looked at him and he said, well, I have to uh, do that. I said, well, first, if you don't give up your judgeship, I'll see to it. I'll frame you if I have to. You have no right to do what you did and you know that. So if you get suspended or you get fined or you go to prison, that's appropriate, whatever they decide with you. Don't you think? You're jingling your change, but you're not poor like the people who rent from you. You need help. So I think very much so, all that you accumulate means pretty much nothing after a while when you get down to basics and you think that you're lucky that you're in a body. Right. How how do you live a heart or soul centered life in this world? I mean, it really goes against, and you ran into this. It goes against the way the world is set up. I and mean, when you started mm -hmm. doing a lot of that police work, people just dissed you. They didn't believe you. They didn't listen. That would, had to be very. You seem to have handled it so well, but it strikes me that that had to be a difficult learning curve for you. Actually, no. What I what I felt. I didn't care what other people, I didn't even hear what other people thought. Uh, and that goes back to my family who was terrified of me opening my mouth <clears throat> and the easiest way they could handle it. Because my mother was very troubled about many things and they went through some very tough things. They'd rather just exile me and pronounce me uh, not welcome in life. And that was fine. It taught me that if I, maybe that's part of the focus I had. I had to focus somewhere that was positive. So for me, when the detectives asked for help again and again, and then when others asked for the help, I felt on a bound always to explain as I have to people who still sometimes don't get it. I have no idea if I can be of any use whatsoever. I never know beforehand. And I may get nothing. And it may take minutes, weeks, days, years, 
whatever. And if you still want my help, then sure, I'll do whatever I can. And so by doing that for myself, that was a setup so I would feel comfortable working. That made it okay for me. And I remember the first detective I worked with, who's a wonder, uh, leaving this earth soon, but still it was amazing at the work. And I said to him, why do you listen to me so much? Because I was a bit nervous about always taking everything I said and running with it. And he said, well, we don't ask you about things we already understand or have good evidence on. We ask you, whether it's a fresh case or a cold case, didn't matter. It's if we have no leads or we have far too many, then whatever you have, and case in point was uh, at the police station itself, where I had, uh, I picked up the phone, I think it was New Year's Day, And I called him at the office and I said, I need you to get over here right away. And he said, well, no, you could just tell me over the phone. I said, that's the whole point. I can't get over. This is the detective you're talking to. Correct. Okay. And so he came over and I said, your chief's office is bugged. He said, we just found out. How did you know? I said, same way I know anything. I don't know how. And so we, it led to a case where eventually the officer was put away for life. He was a murderer. Wow. Right. So it's really the ability to take a chance, right? Yeah. When you look at life and you see the people who are willing to take risks, we know that some of the risks will turn out terrible for us. Those are not bumps in the road. Those are huge bumps in the road. (laughs) They are the mountain bumps, right? And others will just be little bumps that we can uh, contain and make them harmless and make them fun, like a fun ride, you know? So I've always been willing to take the risks and take the consequences pretty much. How do you you distinguish between intuition and psychic ability? Where do they overlap? Well, we know intuition is partly the gut to brain because the gut is the oldest cells in the form of a human. So it has the gut instinct to survive. So intuition is usually very instinctual if it's not ruined by loads, loads of antibiotic rounds, which wipe out good bacteria. If it's not restored or needed, some people aren't born with all the great bacteria they need. So if our gut is operational, then intuition, which is part of the processor of our right hemisphere of our brain, uh, if it's going wrong, it won't be intuition, it'll be fear. And so psychic is, I would say, intuition plus, if you will, Uh, it, it, it forces a much more pinpointed response to a feeling, to an instinctual feeling of walking into a room. You know, in martial arts, they've taught this for thousands of years. You stand looking at a wall in training. I've done it. And let's say it's a big gymnasium and the door is all the way on the other side. You have to tell when somebody is walking in barefoot, making no sound. You have to feel the change in the energy. Well, intuition works like that. You walk into a gathering and somebody you feel super comfortable and some you don't. Why? That's also the regulation of your mind body. Your nervous system is generating uh, feedback, information. Your gut is giving you information, what to feel comfortable with, what not to. Same thing like, pardon me, but a dog. You know, a healthy dog will know who is a safe haven and a good person. That's so true. Right? Well, Mm -hmm. we're the same in that aspect. We can tell the difference if our gut is working right. And then we want to take a deeper dive. We want to discover 
Well, what do we do with intuition? Can we sharpen it? Can we do anything else besides trusting a gut? And many people have to first clear out mind-body stuff to get to their intuition for themselves, particularly if you've been abused in any sense of the word. And my comment is, who hasn't? So uh, the first thing is to kind of recognize that that abuse um, can be dealt with comfortably and handled as a past event and not live it again and again. So once we find that, our intuition gives us permission to like ourselves. You know, if we don't like ourselves, we won't be intuitive for ourselves. Oh, that's a that's a very interesting distinction. Really, a lot of this goes to always going within, and the better you understand yourself, mm-hmm. the better you can understand the environment, the people, the animals around you. Exactly. It's all the same. That's why it's so important that I back, I think it was in the 70s, a uh, Canadian Hunter Thompson, not American, wrote a book on the five different uh, groups that were existing in the U.S. The environmental group was not the peace group. The uh, or- organic movement group was not. The environmental group was not the peace group, The et cetera, et cetera. They were different groups. And I always wondered why they didn't connect. Why were the psychics unhealthy? Uh, the first time I ever went to anything, because I didn't know anybody did the work, I just did what I did, and others labeled it, and I went, okay, we could call it that. Well, I was invited to a place with about 50 other psychics giving short readings, and I thought, well, at least I get to meet people. I have to say that although some of them were fantastic, clear, the odd thing for me was most of them were not healthy. And I thought, that's a contradiction. How do you get clarity internally through your soul to come through the form to use it on this earth if you are not? And I'm not talking about perfect health. I don't have perfect health. I have Lyme. I have a variant that makes me very susceptible to mold. But I do know what they are, and I do stay away from things that can exacerbate it. So it means conscious, to be conscious of what is good for you, what isn't good for you, including relationships, including everything, including, oh, I just like to put that on. It's like perfume um, <laughs> in our in our world or many things. They're not exported because they have so many chemicals that are dangerous to our bodies. I don't understand how that can occur, but I can only say it's not intuitive. It is more greed, shall we say. You know, David Servan Shriver, um, who was, um, yeah. you, you know who he is, yeah, or he was, yeah, pointed that out actually in his book. And it's it's something that um, his, he, po- he, he pointed out that there's a need for a congruency between how we live how we think, what we put in and on our bodies, and that everything in that regard is very connected, perhaps on a a biological or molecular level. Um, And I think that we have lost a lot of that sense of congruency, for lack of a better word, in the way we live day to day. Too many do. Too many. I think that... uh, There are farmers who will refuse to use the toxins, who will bring goats to weed, you know, Uh, but there aren't enough of them, at least in our country. Our country gives benefit to certain kind of farming techniques and gives them offsetting costs. Uh, I never know, you know what, I'm not savvy on it. But I do know that we have a very long way to go before we actually treat this planet well. I think when we also restore land back to the indigenous or give them their rightful due as a result of breaking every peace treaty ever made, you know, I think that's a karmic good start. Then with slavery, that's next. 
So I think that it's an accrued, just like our bodies, just like um, our mindset, which is part of the body. I, we get imprints. And let's say I love potato chips when I'm a little girl, because when I'm very upset and I'm scared and I eat them, I feel better. I'm four years old. What do I know? But if I continue that till age 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or whatever, I'm going to have an accumulated debt to my body. That's going to pay a big price. So I think the same way about everything, which is why I believe in breaking any pattern I find in me that is not serving the earth, not serving me. And I'm not telling you I can do it one, two, three. I'm older. And sometimes it takes longer and sometimes it's one, two, three, because I'm annoyed at me for not getting it. So go ahead, Nancy, go do it now. And I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, yeah. No, no, that's a, you, you talk about accumulated debt to your body. And I th think that there's um, a lot of emotional debt, actually, oh, yeah. that most of us carry. And we're so unaware of it. We just go on and repeat these patterns that may have been a response to a trauma earlier in our lives, but they become an unconscious part of us. Becomes real. Yes. Becomes real. Dr. Candace Pert <clears throat> did a, one of the specials on Bill Moyer's special back in, I think, the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And she was the leading expert in the world of neuropeptides. And people who don't know, look it up. But she said, I'm going to prove that your mind is in every cell of your body. Your emotions are in every cell. And she wrote a book. Her first one was a huge, wonderful book, Molecules of Emotions. Mm -hmm. We know that trauma is stored in what we call the synapse between nerves, which is the bridge between one nerve and another. We also know that things like petrochemicals can be stored there. So it's interrupting the nervous system. That's the accumulation of debt to me. And it was the reason I could see it. My first husband did split brain studies. And while he was homicidal with me about six months into it, I, or nine, something, but I could, I'd go to the laboratory and I'd listen to all the neurophysiology and I'd go, ah, interesting because I had been paralyzed later and I was able to walk in three days by using the understanding of how my brain, gut, and, and nervous system work together and to reteach it, to offset the damage and map out neural mapping, just like for brain injured babies. I had volunteered for that. So all of that put together said, wait a minute, uh, our mind, is not us. It's an instrument. It's an instrument that also stores the trauma. It also stores great memory, happy memories, right? Endorphins we can make just by rethinking great moments in life. So in the same way, when we go into a trauma, I found for myself, uh, if, if I found a way to see the strength I had rather than focus as much on the trauma, but what came from it for me, not negatively, even though it was, I had surgery post-op, I almost died twice. I get that. But what I did get is I became me. It's as simple as that. So when you recognize that out of most trauma, the phoenix does rise again and again. Because there's no promise, benediction of Patchy's last words in a wedding prayer, there's no promise of tomorrow on this earth. So for me, it's like, well, then make the most of whatever you got and st not stop complaining because I think that's part of our makeup sometimes. I can complain, but at the moment I do, I start looking at references and thinking, okay, I'm back in a wheelchair last few days. Temporary. I'm moving myself right out. I know what to do know how to do it, know what to use. And thank God I have a husband who is the best nurse in the world for me and loves me dearly. Go so, back to that process. I don't mean to interrupt, but go back to that process of healing because that's really interesting, I think, to a lot of people. Okay. So for me, healing is, it begins with controlling your own mind. Begins. In understanding that we know now on the Western Hemisphere, 
which <laughs> took thousands of years for us to accept with laboratories and research, that the right hemisphere of the brain processes everything first. And in the middle of the brain on top is called the mid-fissure or corpus callosum. So if the right hemisphere processes it, whatever it is, any information that comes in, it needs to go to the left hemisphere because that's the not that's the linear intelligence, mm-hmm. meaning it'll ground it and make it practical. Okay. But if it's so traumatic to you and you're frozen, you're terrified, whatever, and it's so strong, and it could be just a thought or it could be an event, doesn't matter. It could be, it could be poisons. It could be anything. What happens is the right hemisphere keys in the alarm, the fire alarm in the brain, shortcuts it down and sends it along a pathway called the sympathetic nervous system to the adrenal gland. So people get palpitations, racing heart, terrified, blah, 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 every time they think of it. And that's because they're switching on the sympathetic nervous system, which will shut down your digestion, your sleep, your rest. So you do that often enough, you got problems. Well, when I understood that, I was lying in bed. I had, this was another event. I lost my, the use of my leg for six weeks. The chief of neurosurgery was a dear friend. He was the uh, boss for my first husband and he kept in touch with me. So whenever he did something new, he wanted to help. And he said, electroshock acupuncture. I just got certified. Let's go. Let's do it. So he did. (laughs) And I stood up and went right down to the floor, lost all feeling to my left leg. So I'm in the hospital for six weeks. The fifth week, he doesn't know what to do with me. He comes in every day. We test, nothing. About a few days into the sixth week, I go, you know, Nancy, you're stupid. Cut it out. You know what to do. So let's see what we can do. So I picked a vision of something I would, that I could do physically, but I would have to do it in a way that would be very, very tough and that I would never be terrified to do. That would raise the focus make it very sharp. So I picked, I had done ballet and toe for many years when I was young. Love it. Still, I mean, that's, I grew up wanting to be Anna Pavlova. So I pictured myself putting on the toe shoes, climbing up every detail of it. I mean, every detail. I could smell the resin standing up with the toes. I felt the satin ribbons. I I knew I'd had to make it alive as if it was occurring. And I climbed the ladder and I went on the rope and I danced. And I did that for hours all day. I just kept doing it because I never lost focus with that. You know how you can listen to somebody and your mind wanders or you're trying to focus or meditate or anything and your mind goes somewhere else? Well, I had to pick something my mind would not go elsewhere. It was training the brain and nervous system to send the messages to the muscles and get over whatever it is. And in three days, I walked like nothing happened. I've done that again and again and again every time because I have a congenital deformity genetically similar to, uh, it's rare among normal sized people, it's common among dwarfs. So I have a genetically inherited dwarf in my history somewhere because that's mine. So my spine can slip off the base and I can be paralyzed or something else will happen where I can't move one part of my body, whatever. So I've learned how to just teach it again and again. And it works. Four days ago, I couldn't do a single thing uh, except painfully transfer to a wheelchair from a chair. I've been sleeping in the recliner. And at night, all I do is lie there and focus and then fall asleep. And today, I was able to walk. Are you familiar with Joe Dispenza's story? Sure. Yeah, but I I only became familiar with him a few years ago. I didn't read anybody when I was starting. No one. What I read was brain research. Okay, no. Since we're 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 getting into a book club here, (laughs) have you read uh, Have you read Jill Bolt uh, Taylor's recent book? I found I haven't read any of them. Now I stopped. Uh Um, My focus is on learning certain things I've never learned before. So every time I do that, I drop everything else. 
I normally I read a lot, but my favorite books are not those now. <laughs> what are your favorite what are your favorite books now or or none? Uh mysteries, political thrillers, non it cannot be nonfiction. I used to love biographies. I used to love all those. Uh I go through phases. I'm happy to go through phases. Uh it gives me something, but my learning curve is much more now on what do you do if you want to host a podcast? Because I think it's fascinating. My son loves podcasts and he got me very interested. So I'm uh, like a pre-kindergarten, mm -hmm. right? And so I said to my husband, I just bought a microphone. It looks like a really good one. He said, did you get an amp? A pre I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so... I take courses and things like that. I'm fascinated by things I don't know. Well, you know, that goes to, to two things. It goes to beginner's mind, what the Buddhists call beginner's mind, which I think is such an important mindset to have throughout your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that something can always be new and fresh, and even if you have some expertise in it, stop and be a beginner again. It's so powerful. I, I read... I don't even remember where, but it made so much sense because I had looked at it for years and never put it in words until I heard somebody else. Uh, anybody who's an expert in anything has a problem or considers themselves an expert. If you're very good at something, there's an assumption that you're going to be very good at something else. But I don't remember the name of the book I read back in the 70s. And it was about uh, the birth of, not children, but the birth of your creativity, your ritual, your, like the ancient cave days, matriarchal societies, how it was very important to be egoless, uh, to be always pregnant with ideas. They had a headless woman drawn on a cave ancient times. And it meant an egoless person birthing ideas, creation, whether it's in form of human or form of anything, it was important to know no ego involved, meaning you're not an expert. You're always beginning. And I've always felt that way. And a good friend once was talking about the hesitation of somebody he loved and I was surprised. He said, you know, Nancy, the harder things are for you, the more you start something brand new all over after you went through a trauma. Every time you've gone through trauma, I know you're going to come out with another project. And he said, well, that's how I recover. Well, no, I that's actually, that's fascinating because I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, how do people get over these bumps and things? And part of it is energy. You have to introduce energy into the equation. It means moving forward, newness, novelty. It doesn't have to be the right path. It doesn't matter. It'll propel you in the right direction. I love it because that's so true. Uh, many times I have not gone on the right path at all. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. It's a big club, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and that says there are a lot of good people who understand. Keep moving. Keep moving forward. Yeah. You know, in your book, you mentioned the Dancing Wu Lee Masters, <laughs> excuse me, which I have not read, but I've read some of Gary Zukov's other books, which I just love because he yep. looks at the world in terms of energy flows. And that Only. so syncs up with what you're saying. Gary, uh, back when in the 1970s uh, and before, Lynn Schroeder and Sheila Ostranda wrote Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain in the early 70s. Lynn happened to live fairly local to me. I met her in 1979 when her new book, Super Learning, was coming out about how we learn literally in the brain and music and music research. That was an excerpt and further studies from, from the psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain. So, because they had traveled all over. So she was coming to a place, I forget where, but I thought I'd surprise her. It was local enough and I was off. So I thought, oh, they're having a lot of workshops. So I go there, and I had read Dancing Wooly Masters. And, oh, Gary Sukhoff's going to be in the next room after her workshop. How perfect. So I go into that, and there are about 200 people in the audience, and I'm sitting maybe halfway down on an aisle. 
and Gary's talking and suddenly he loses track of what he is figuring out. And I see it because I'm following everything he says and I'm seeing where it goes. And he looks in my direction and nods and then picks up. And I thought, oh, Nancy, you know, between you being paranoid or thinking somebody's uh, really relating to you, you're funny. So when it was over, Gary came running up to me and said, can we go talk? I have to thank you for what you did. You You sent me that. And I thought, oh, it was real. Huh. And we had a wonderful conversation for about an hour. And after that, he would write to me occasionally and I would write back and then life took off or whatever. I lost track. And so I read Seed of the Soul and I love Gary's work. It's beautiful. And each person opens the door differently for others. And so I think all of us everyone who cares to open the doors for others or teachers. Teachers and perhaps healers. Well, teaching is healing to me, right? That, that if, is if true. You're going to it give can be. Seed, right. You're planting seeds, whether they take it or not, whether they use them ever or not, that doesn't matter. That's not up to you. That's, you know, it's not up to me whether they get it or not. It's not up to me whether they uh, get what I'm telling them or not in anything, in any of the sessions or whatever. If it resonates good, if it doesn't think about it or not, that's okay. If you could plant some global seeds, (laughs) what would you plant? I think the hardest change needed is the one that we, for me, I focus on. Uh, And I look at it as I don't remember his name because I don't follow any sport, but the, uh, the U S team that just won against Iran and the spokesperson who's only 23. I think if everyone heard his speech to the questioner, from Iran, who was furious at him calling it Iran, his response was something I wish everyone would learn how to speak. He is the teacher on how to speak. He didn't get annoyed. He didn't get uh, anything other than say, I am sorry. I will never call it mistaken again. However, and the guy, uh, the questioner, said some other things that were very negative about oh, Black Lives Matter and how the U.S. treats blacks. Well, the answer was absolutely stunning. He said, you know, I grew up in a white family. He's black. He said, and I've traveled the world. I've been very fortunate. And all cultures have their own problems. Every one of them. He said their own prejudice in different ways. He didn't point them out. He just pointed the world. And so when we look at it globally, if we can, as individuals, take a different stance when somebody, oh, you know, it's all about rejection and approval in some ways. If you don't accept what I say or you don't approve of it or you get angry at it, I can either be an adult like he was, or I can be childish and pout or be mad or another adult screaming back at you over it. And so I think those choices also accumulate. And if enough of us learned, you know, the language of kindness, but real kindness and intelligent kindness, I'll call it like he did, uh, he didn't back down from his own stance of this prejudice everywhere. It's all over the planet. It's always been. Now we need to change it for sure, I'm saying. And the way we don't change it is to look outside of somebody. It's to look inside. Many years ago, I worked on a self-esteem project with somebody from the, I think she was from the attorney general's office at that point. And we were assigned to see what we can do. Never bore fruit because nobody was ready. But for me, self-esteem begins with restoration of self-esteem when you're young. If you're beaten at home, 
if you're screened at all the time, if your mom or dad is an alcoholic drug user and they can't put their heads together straight to give you structure, you need it somewhere and you need to be encouraged as a child. So for me, it begins prenatal that all babies should, all pregnant women should have absolute total access to everything they need. They walk into an office. My dream is that they have soft music in the background. They have waterfall flowing in the office. They are treated regardless of money or no money. This is disgusting in any culture not to treat the protection of a soon-to-be-born. They have, in cord blood studies, over 15 years ago they started, more petrochemicals in the cord blood than ever. It's a set up all known disease for children. So this is a crazy thing. And we have to begin at the beginning. And the beginning is if you see people drowning at the side of a river and you keep pulling them out, you have to go to the head of the river to find out why they're falling in. But they're falling in because they begin life without enough. Sometimes without enough nutrition, sometimes with not enough good parenting, sometimes without a roof over their head, sometimes so scared because their parent went through a trauma pregnant. My daughter did. I was five months pregnant and I knew what I'd have to do to soothe her. And I took every step I could to do that to augment more positive things while I was pregnant. I warded myself off. I took her every day across to where the bay was, listened to the wind and the palm trees, made up songs for her, that kind of thing. I wanted her to get good information, not terror all the time, and not terror for me. So I know it begins at the beginning, but then when they hit school or anything, preschool, there has to be a way to help them build their self-esteem. Prejudice is anger at either the home or the situation they're in, whatever it is, turned outward. They're too frightened to give it to the people who deserve it. So that's my take, and I'm sticking to it. (laughs) (laughs) You have had more than a few bumps on the road. If you could, if you could read, and you've had, you, you have an amazing life. What, if you could rewrite your story, would you? No. No. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.